on, what's going on, what's going on, ballers? And welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball podcast. And as you all know, with this podcast, the focus overall is to share stories, strategies, and successes to ultimately be a resource and a guide for up and coming student athletes um, and students that are transitioning into the world of professionalism. And today we have a guest on, and he is the future Dr. Tim Bryson. Um, and Tim, you're, 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 you're a podcast host. You know, you're an individual who uh, works um, in higher education. So how are how, how you doing today? How you doing? You're not too bad, man. I definitely appreciate you for, um, for having me on the show. Uh, overall, I mean, I'm not going to say it's a lot going on in the country because that would be false. Uh, there's a lot of racial injustice, a lot of social injustice. Uh, we're still in the midst of a global health crisis. So uh, to have my health uh, and have my family's health, I can say I'm blessed. So I appreciate you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely glad to have you on. And uh, man, Tim, I just want to go ahead and di dive right into it, man, because you're probably one of the people that I've seen uh, j just most active and also one of the people that I've seen that that's really striving um, for change in a real way, um, j just in regards to like, like you're saying, j just about the racial injustice that has been going on. So, Tim, just just talk a little bit, because I want you to talk a little bit about one, like, why did you decide to, to, to start your podcast? Because I feel like the two correlate, but correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. Yes, I mean, for me, I mean, well, I would have start. So my podcast is entitled uh, Walk with TFB, my initials. Um, the purpose of my podcast is to have unfiltered conversation with authentic people centered on education, sport, and culture. Um, and so thinking about my podcast and how it, became, how it came into existence, um, over the last four years, I've had a personal website. Um, it's been a place where I've uh, documented my experiences, uh, my failures, my lessons learned, um, as my personal mission statement is to help others identify their passion, inspire a vision, and walk in purpose, right? Um, so similar to your podcast, one of the ways we do that is, is by storytelling. Uh, when I started my website, my, my mode of storytelling was, you know, writing blogs and having people read them. Um, and for me, when I started and I told myself, and I'm, I'm taking the same philosophy in my podcast now, is that um, I'm not writing for people to read them. I'm writing for myself uh, to even look mm -hmm. back, you know, months and years later to say, like, wow, like, look how far I've come or look what I was, look what I was thinking about, look where I was, you know, feeling, you know, back, you know, two years ago when I was in a certain situation as a, as a mode of inspiration for me. Um, but the podcast in particular, is, you know, stem from life experiences. And so I'm a former student athlete uh, at Coastal Carolina University down in Conway, South Carolina. Um, I'm a former athletic training student and certified athletic trainer uh, where I earned my uh, athletic training degree from the University of South Carolina at Columbia. Um, I'm an educator uh, in every sense of the word. And so uh, my grad experience uh, at The Ohio State University, I earned my master's in higher, edu higher education and student affairs. I um, have some experiences working in athletics, whether it's the NCAA national office as a postgrad intern or my current role um, as a program director for student athlete career development in Maryland. And what I found through living in different cities and states and regions, right, living in South Carolina, living in Indiana, living in Ohio, traveling the country to see the world, um, traveling the country and the world, excuse me, what I've seen in education, uh, not just my formal education, but also, you know, like the lifelong learner. Uh, that I am, you know, while learning through social media platforms, other, other digital platforms, and what I've seen through sport, not just as an athlete, but also as a, uh, as a fan, is that they, they, rarely, they rarely intersect. And so what I mean by that is that mm. moments of intersection are often met with uh, resistance, are often met with opposition, and we can never really have a, I have not yet to find a space where I can talk about education, sport, and culture um, in a way that's um, unfiltered and authentic. Um, and so that's the... Um, the foundation of my podcast that I started uh, just a month ago at this point. Yeah, man. Yeah. And I mean, I've been listening to the podcast. I definitely can appreciate uh, just the, the diverse individuals that you have on there, but I really like that the aspect of how, how you're taking yourself uh, in, in, in allowing yourself to have those authentic and unfiltered conversations. And then you're also bringing in other people who are also educated as well. And, and they're able to share another side of them. Uh, and they're able to just show people that the intersections and why they're so relevant and even, you know, how, how, how multifaceted people can be. So exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and, and thinking about just, just people being multifaceted, Tim. So I did a little bit of digging on you, man. And you, you have all the intersections. 
<laughs> I, 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 mean, I can say that. What, 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 did you, what did you find? Talk to me what you found. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. So I saw one, I saw you were, you were a homecoming king. Oh, yeah, I was, 2015. Yep. I, yeah. I, I forgot about that. Yeah, you, you forgot about it. Okay, so, okay, so I saw, saw homecoming king, and I was like, oh, okay. Okay, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, um, something else I saw was, you know, that, that, that you're a, a, a member of Kappa Lada. Kappa Lada. Help me out, Tim. Yeah, Help Kappa Iota chapter, Phi Beta Semi Fraternity Incorporated. There we yes, go. Sir. There we go. Yep. There we go. There we Greek go. life. I yeah. mean, so, ever, like I said, ever since um, really undergrad, and after my experience at, at uh, Coastal Carolina when I was only a student athlete, when I got to South Carolina, I said, I'm going to get involved, uh, not just – you know, to further develop and refine leadership skills, uh, but also just to meet people and find community. Um, so I have experiences in inter intramural sports, uh, interpersonal violence prevention work. Um, I sat on the academic misconduct committee at, uh, at Ohio State. I helped revise the code of conduct at Ohio State. I was on an ad hoc committee. Uh, currently serve in a sexual assault prevention committee uh, representative role, representing athletics. Um, just my that's just like my professional life uh, i love crab beer I have a, I have a crab beer instagram that i uh, that i run it's, it's been pretty it's been pretty dope so far like i just follow again my mission statement is to help others identify their passion inspire vision um, and walk in their purpose and so um i would be hypocritical not to do that myself and so everything that you've seen are things that i've been passionate about definitely definitely so so tell us a little bit about the ipa way tell, tell us a little bit about that tim yeah, so the IPA wave started uh, when I got to when I moved to the DMV back in February 2019. Um, and so this uh, beer Instagram is what people call it, I guess, uh, was to help underrepresented, particularly Black people, um, become introduced and socialized into the craft beer industry. So similar to education, similar to athletics, um, similar to any other facet of this um, of this of the United States, uh, we know that it's a white world, and so what that means is that you know there are white systems that continue to hold back and prevent and really inhibit um, non-whites from being involved and in, in engaged in serving in leadership roles in different industries. And so I found um, really a hole and a gap um, in the craft beer space. Um, and so what started was, um, and shout out to Nicholas Matebi, um, he's doing great work down at UCF actually, who encouraged me to uh, really make this Instagram. When I moved to India, I would just post pictures of, um, of craft beer when I used to go do work um, at the different breweries in the indie scene. Um, and so my personal Instagram, was just like riddled with crab beer pictures. And so one day Nick was like, yo, you need to start an Instagram page. And I'm like, yo, like no one's gonna, no one's gonna like, like follow this page, bro. He's like, no, I just started. Um, so literally I started February 19, or February 2019. Um, and now I have over like I think 1300 followers. Uh, oh, I've wow. been connected with people across the country who are doing phenomenal work to also help diversify the industry. Um, but I've been really taking that step forward now and focus on how can we create um, equitable and socially just environments for black people to exist, right? Exist and visit um, crab breweries. And so that's what I'm also super passionate about as well. So when, so when did be you becoming so like multifaceted and just like, was this a culture that, that was created when, when you were young or, or as you've gotten older, you just been really enjoying learning new things and uh, being able to connect with different people? Like when did this all start? Yeah, I think it's twofold. So one, I, and I'm, I appreciate you saying a multifaceted. I think even you saying that just now, it just hit me, had a, uh, a revelation is that I'm not multifaceted. Like what people are seeing is me, right? Mm. They're seeing the different parts of me mm. uh, and just different spaces. So whether that's the podcast, the website, uh, the inst my personal Instagram, my beer Instagram, my LinkedIn, like, but it's all under that same mission statement, which is identify passion, inspire vision, walk in purpose. And so um, I think what really hit me was probably in undergrad, um, because throughout, throughout high school, uh, playing soccer and, um, and running track, I was never team captain. I was never like a, a honorary captain. Um, and so like I'd always watch the leadership, right? I watched the leadership, witnessed it, uh, witnessed like what I did like, what I didn't like. Um, and when I got to undergrad, I, I kept saying like, yo, like why doesn't someone do X, Y, and Z? Like we know the right thing to do is, you know, A, B, and C, but why, like no one's doing it. Um, and so I kept waiting for someone to lead. Uh, and I think and I can't pinpoint the exact moment. Uh, but when I, once I turn that switch on that I am the leader, right, like that, that we can walk together um, uh, in lockstep to see change um, and, and walk in purpose, um, I said, like, F it, like it's time to leave. And so everything that I've done is like, OK, I like craft beer. I got some uh, support and encouragement from from friends and colleagues. Like, let's do it. Like, let's walk. Yeah, I like I mean, I like the fact that you said you, you were waiting for somebody to lead. First of all, I like the fact that you acknowledge that. Um, yeah. And then the fact that you actually just took the action that followed. 
Um, and and just thinking about that, Tim, why why do you think so many people don't want to lead, or, or or why why do you think that? Yeah, why why do you think some people don't don't want that opportunity or don't take that opportunity to lead? Yeah, I think part of it is that people don't people, and I'm speaking obviously, in, we're speaking in generalizations right mm-hmm, now. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Don't know what leadership is or what leadership means or what leadership looks like. Um, I think we have an idea like what it can be from from a positional perspective, right? Um, but helping helping people, helping students, educating people, educating students like what their power, their innate power is, and, and their power is really in their purpose, right? So if you know what your passion is, or if you can identify some things you're passionate about, um, if you can inspire this vision, right, this shared vision uh, to bring people along with you and walk in your purpose, your people are going to be walking with you as you continue to, um, you know, cultivate and refine your purpose. And so for me, it's, it's uh, a lack of knowledge on what leadership is, is obviously a fear of failure. Um, but we know, you know, it's important to just fail forward and learn from it and keep moving. Uh, but also this fear of judgment. Um, and so, um, over the last couple of weeks, there've been several people who say like, how do you, how do you do all the, like all these things? And it's like, like my, like my brain, like what you're seeing is later my brain in real life, right? It's my heart in real life. It's my purpose in real life. And so it's not hard necessarily. I think the hard part is trying to find um, not balance, but time for self-care and self-love, radical mm-hmm. self-love. Um, but I've also found radical self-love and radical self-care in the work that I've done in the, the purpose work that I've done um, to help others walk in their purpose as well. Mm, wow. Okay, so with you, so with you being an individual who enjoys helping other people identify their purpose, you know, b- being in a space to where you love what you do and what you do you truly love, like, it, is there ever opportunity to where you could potentially become burnt out because you're always ripping and running, you're always doing something, you're always helping people? Like, what? T- talk a little bit about that. No, definitely. And so um, this year, uh, my theme for the year is availability. Um, and, and part of that is making sure that the things that I'm doing um, obviously add value or can add value to me. Um, but before I say yes, making sure that I can add value to said opportunity. And if I cannot add value, if I cannot give my whole self to op- said opportunity, then, then I, I will say no. Um, and I, I've had to do that a couple of times over the last month. Um, and so um, part of where I... Um, can and will continue to be better is uh, enforcing Tim's 10%, which is something I wrote about on my website. Um, so taking at least two, two and a half hours out of the week, right? Taking 10% of the week and just focusing on me. Uh, and what that looks like for me is going to a brewery, um, particularly on a Sunday, um, sitting down my AirPods and my laptop out and, and doing whatever Tim Bryson feels like doing on that, on that day. Um, and that's been super helpful and also a place where I found my love for craft beer uh, because I would, I would just go every Sunday uh, to my spot in Indy and just write, just write, just think. Uh, do do what I now do what I now call purpose work, uh, which is work that uh, again aligns with my passion, my vision, and my, and my purpose in this world. Man, that's super dope. Tim Tim's ten percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check it out. It's on timothyfbryson.com. dot com. Dang. Okay. Okay. Dang. I was on the website. I missed that. That's crazy. Okay. Okay. Man, I think that's really powerful. I think that I think that's really impactful for you to have that level of awareness or self awareness to say, you know what, I do need to recharge. I need to take a step back. And then ultimately, so I can give all of me to everything that I'm doing. And now that, that just brings me to, to, to this, Tim, because I saw you're going, going for the doctorate. And, and, and you're, going, you're going for the doctorate in, in student affairs or higher education? Yep, yep student affairs. Okay, okay. So, so, so with you now, now being where you are and, and already have achieved, you know, what, what you've achieved, you, you, have the, you have the master's from the Ohio State University. That's important. That's important. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got you got to put the D on it, or, or it's not real. And and, and then right. and, and and then in addition to that, now now you're deciding that to go for the doctor. So so what is it now that that really is propelling you to to, to strive for that? Yeah, I knew when I graduated from my master's program that I wasn't done. Um, I didn't feel done. I mean, I was tired. I was, I was really tired, but I, I know I'm done. <laughs> um, and really, since working at working in college athletics in particular. And like I mentioned before, like I have a background in student affairs, but I work, at least on paper, my check is from athletics. Um, there continues to be a divide in how not just athletics and student affairs collaborate and work with one another, but also how academic affairs plays a role um, in, that, in that relationship. Uh, because from academic affairs, student affairs and athletics, I mean, those are really the three main um, areas of, a, of an institution. And so, um, 
my work at the NCAA, whose mission is to help integrate, um, you know, academics, or, sorry, help, to help integrate college sport into higher education to ensure the educational experience of the, of the student athlete is paramount. From now working at the University of Maryland, I'm realizing that like there's a gap in that part of it is that they don't want to work together. Part of it is that they don't know like what each other does. Part of it is that there's different language, like it's literally code switching going from like one, going from my athletics office to the career center about like how I, how I uh, want to talk about students, talk about the student experience. Um, mm. And so I want to help bring people together, right? Bring education, sport and culture together. Um, and so I'm pursuing my PhD at Maryland to, um, to do that, number one. Uh, but foremost, number two, uh, to create, again, equitable and socially just environments for all students to identify their passion, inspire vision and walk in purpose. And I know I continue to reiterate that and I hope it, I hope it sticks in people's brains. Um, but again, that's super important to me because those are the three areas in which I function as a, as a human, as a professional, um, as an educator, um, because right now we're seeing, and particularly like what my, what I think my research interest will be in or research, uh, will focus on in my experience is that like from a non-white student athlete perspective, right? There's a lot, there's a lack of support, uh, a lack of knowledge and really, um, a dismissal of international athletes uh, on college campuses, right? So there's a lot of different rules. So like a student athlete who's not from the state of Maryland who comes to um, UMD, they have a different experience as an out-of-state student, right? Whether that's from a state perspective, whether it's from an institution perspective, if they're an athlete from an athletics perspective. But international students have a federal, have federal guidelines, federal rules and policies that they also have to adhere and follow to. So prime example. An international student athlete who wants to stay uh, in the States when they, when they graduate, um, of course, has to apply for OPT. Um, but their job, but their job in the States has to relate to their academic major, right? Oh, wow. So what we're finding now, or what I found is from personal experience, um, not just at Maryland, but other schools as well, is that you have academic advisors either in academic college and or athletics who are advising and or coaching students to pursue majors that may have a harder time or 0% chance to receive sponsorship for when they graduate. So what happens? They, they leave. They have to leave the country. They're forced out of the country. Wow. So... Furthermore, for those international athletes that want to work in college sport, we are finding that, and I have international friends who are going through these processes now, the student affairs side of campus, academic and academics affairs, side, the student affairs and academic affairs side of campus supports visas for international students. Mm -hmm. Sorry, international graduates. Athletics has a hard time wanting to sponsor said, or same visas. So why are we just missing diverse talent, particularly international talent from working in our athletic departments? Well, the answer is because of bias. It's because of um, lack of knowledge. It's because of uh, an unwillingness to learn and want to cooperate um, to keep diverse talent within the field. And so you're finding international athletes like kind of just wandering, you know, through their uh, time as an undergraduate student because they don't know like where they're going to work. They don't know if they can work in certain places. You have a lot of athletes, international athletes who um, are literally what, four than fifth years on, on college campuses who don't have a social security number. So when they had to apply for mm -hmm. OBT, they like where do I go right like how do you you've been in the states for four years and don't have a uh, don't have a social security number and that's not from a lack of well one could argue that's from a uh, that's a lack of knowledge on the athlete which I think is a deficit centered approach but I believe it's on the system that currently exists and how we best support international athletes that come to the states and that first and foremost starts with coaches educating themselves on what needs to be done to ensure that these international athletes have a uh, equitable and really equal uh, opportunity to succeed in the United States of America and I recognize that as someone with obviously um, American privilege. Mm, wow. And then that's compounded on the fact of that they're, they're, they're focusing. Well, that's compounded on the fact of them being a student, also them being an athlete and then having to get all those other things in place. So that's additional stressors. Which again, so like even in that situation, right? You have an, if you have an international athlete that plays golf, um, we have several at Maryland from an international student service perspective, international student support service perspective, they're too athletic to receive help, right? Because they're, they're an athlete, they have help over in the athletic space. Mm. From an athletics perspective, like they have all the support, whether it's from academics or whatever, athletic training, nutrition, whatever, but athletics is not equipped with the knowledge that, I, that international student support offices have. At some mm. point they had to communicate, like they need to communicate, but, but mm. more so than just communicating, they both have to understand that they're not international student athletes, like they're a student, right? And so we cannot continue to say student athlete, international student athlete, black student athlete. If we're not looking, we as um, those who work on college campuses look at students from an educator lens and that they are students, like support the student. Every, there are different uh, identity um, 
uh, identities that they'll, you know, um, self-assign themselves to, which of course will influence how we can better support them. But at its core, like how are you supporting the student? And I don't think that, um, honestly, we as an athletics um, community uh, are best doing so uh, in this current moment. And we're seeing that with all these different, uh, like think tanks and brainstorming sessions that athletic departments are having right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, wh well what are some things that y'all are doing at, at the University of Maryland? Because I mean, I know, like I've seen some, you know, pretty innovative things and, uh, you know, with the Twitter chats and I've seen like y'all doing a lot of different type uh, training. So are there, are there any particular things you want to highlight that you think y'all are, you, you think y'all are doing pretty well right now, just with, from a training perspective? Yeah, definitely. So first and foremost, our, our um, internship academy. So this is our eight week summer internship program um, that the Maryland Maze Student Athlete Development Unit hosts every summer, well, at least the last five summers. Um, it's a paid internship experience because I don't believe in paid internship or unpaid internships because again, it perpetuates uh, these systems of power, particularly around finances and who has uh, the mm -hmm. privilege to, you know, work unpaid or not work, to participate in unpaid internship roles, oftentimes, which are the gatekeepers to different positions that exist, whether at the graduate school level and or full-time work. Um, that's another side, that's another just passion of mine right now. But eight-week paid internship program, uh, student athletes work up to 20 hours a week around their athletic and academic schedules. Um, uh, prior, to not, prior to me and my supervisor, Risa, getting here, uh, all the internships were internal to the athletic department. We scratched that, understanding that they're more than an athlete. And while I'm on this topic, helping staff, athletic staff, understand that they're more than just an athletic staff member, that they're an educator, that they're a higher education administrator and professional. Um, and so that currently you can work uh, internal to the athletic department, you can work in student affairs, you can work uh, externally in a nonprofit setting or even a for-profit, uh, a corporate setting uh, outside of the university. Um, and this is huge for us because we can hire international athletes to get meaningful work experience, right? Because they, they can work through the athletic department and get paid through the athletic department. They don't have to use OPT ahead of time. It's also huge for us because we've instituted a number of different changes to our internship program. Um, and I got to give a shout out to uh, Carmen down in um, the University of South Carolina, who really uh, helped me uh, change and, and tweak our program to better reflect like what an inter a meaningful internship experience should be. Uh, mm -hmm. So Carmen was doing, you know, weekly professional development sessions to bring the, the um, internship cohort together, which I think is phenomenal. So we instituted that this, um, this summer. Um, in addition, uh, I implemented uh, weekly reflections, again, because the, the purpose of an internship is not just work experience, but also education, right? Education and exposure. So weekly, they get different prompts um, that they have to respond to about like what they're learning and seeing in their role, right? And reflecting mm -hmm. on that to be able to name, to be able to name it, process it, and articulate it in not just um, an interview, but also on um, digital platforms, as well as uh, application materials. Um, so the internship academy is one. The second thing I'll say we're doing extremely well is our leadership academy. So uh, Risa Lovelace started this program. It's a five-week leadership program that she modeled off of the leadership and service um, programs at the University of Maryland. So again, the importance of campus collaborations. Um, so there was 15 people in that cohort this past spring. Yeah, this past spring. Again, five weeks long, uh, but yeah, straight to the point, right? Um, understanding students, athletes, time commitments. And then the last thing that I'll highlight would be our, um, our Gossip Fellows program. Um, so this is a two-year leadership or two-year career and leadership program uh, where student athletes meet once a month uh, and at the, at the end of their two years they complete a legacy project and then are awarded a $1,500 honorarium that can go towards their postgraduate career plans which is super exciting as well. Oh wow wow man okay well I mean I, I mean I knew y'all was doing some amazing things but now getting to see behind the curtain and now getting to see you know some of some of the inner workings of, of the programs and the leadership academies uh, and the different things that y'all have. Tim, y'all doing a great job, man. Doing our part, man. This should be, but again, this should be the norm. Like, it shouldn't be something we celebrate. Like, this should be like what, um, not just every athletic department is doing because there are some things that we're doing that I think we could, ex that we could outsource and, and, and better collaborate with our student affairs, academic affairs partners on. But I think that's the switch that what you just mentioned was a switch that I think needs, that needs and has to occur um, within athletic departments, right? Like, we got to support the student. And everything that we're doing, we're like, all right, the, is it co-constructed with a student? Because that's a big thing of ours, like co-construction, right? If it's not co-constructed, then and it's not student-driven, then we're not doing it. And so everything that we're doing is continuing to be uh, student-driven and co-constructed as well. Excellent, excellent. So just thinking of j just just how things have been going, and like we talked about briefly, uh, just just in the, in the intro earlier. Uh, so j just being on the cutting edge. So you 
curated, I, I think would be, would be the best ti title for it. You, you curated a, a Twitter chat and, mm. and the Twitter chat was black in sport. Can, can, can you just talk with me about how that came about? And then also just talk about, you know, just the purpose of it all. Yeah, so I can't go any further and will not go any further without um, giving credit to Christia um, down at um, U of L, Louisville, mm -hmm. and then Sherrod, who I believe is at Commerce down in Texas. Um, so I'll never forget this. It was a Tuesday, and I was um, trying to get some pizza, actually. But anyway, long story short, I was in the car, <laughs> and I saw I was on Twitter just scrolling, and I saw a Twitter chat happen, and I was like, it was Blackout Tuesday. And I said, there's no way like a Twitter chat is happening right now on Blackout Tuesday. Like they must be talking about um, like black, like I'm sorry, like racial injustice or racial justice. So I had tweeted something out. Like, I know I'm not looking at a Twitter chat right now. Christia had said something similar. Sherrod had followed up and said something uh, similar as well. So to your point about leadership, Sherrod had added um, uh, YSP, YP sports chat and said, well, we look forward to next week's conversation, you know, focused on amplifying black voices right mm -hmm. and that's when i was like you know i just made my uh podcast instagram and i said yo like that's our problem like and i mentioned this in my podcast that tim talks and that for the longest i've waited on white people to create safe and brave spaces for black people to um, amplify their own voices right like why should we wait on someone else to create a space whether it's digital or physical for us just to speak and be heard um so that's when i said like i reached out to both of them and said yo just a heads up well, well, I actually added him. I said, yo, I got you next week. Next week, we had the Black and Sport Twitter chat, and it was amazing to see the engagement um, and involvement of not just Black professionals, but also non-Black professionals who wanted, who, who observed, who listened, um, and even at times contributed to the conversation and added value to the conversation. I think that was one of the, um, one of the first times that I've really been uh, uh, proud uh, to be an athletics professional, because I think we came together at that point to say, like, you know what, not, not just this is enough, but this is enough and here's how we can be supported and here's how we can move forward together. Um, and so I know many people on that call, on that Twitter chat have gone on over the last, what, three weeks now to do some uh, great work within their own institutions. And so uh, it, it was the first Twitter chat, uh, definitely won't be the last, um, but definitely an exciting moment for us, uh, black professionals who are currently working in sport. Yeah, man, I mean, that was a really, that was a really great one for sure. Uh, because I was in San Antonio and I stay in Dallas. So I was running back and forth because I was visiting my, my wife's family. So I was trying to respond back and I was trying to make sure I used the hashtag and everything like that, because I, I, I didn't want to miss out on that. Cause I know that that's something that that's historic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because we, as a people and, and me saying we, as a people, I'm talking about us in the United States. And I mean, even, even beyond we, I, I don't think that we can allow uh, the movement and the progress that has been made, and I'm saying progress loosely, but the progress sure, has been yeah. made, uh, we, we, we can't allow that to fall by the wayside. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and then just, just thinking that, Tim, I, I got to ask you, like, you, you just said mm -hmm. for, for too long, you know, we, we've been waiting for, you know, e either, either white people or people of other, other races to bring the conversation for, for us to then be a part. Uh, so do you feel it's, it's our duty to, to reach out and, and start the conversation with people who don't look like us? I mean, just being kind of the language, I don't think it's our responsibility or duty per se. Um, I right. do believe that we have a responsibility or should feel a responsibility or, have, or be empowered to have ownership over our own voice. Mm. I think those are two different questions, right? Like, I think I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to be silent to keep someone else warm. And I mentioned that in my Tim talks too, right? Like, I'm not going to burn my, continue to burn myself to keep others warm. And so, mm. like, my, the podcast, the website is for me to write and talk, right? And if you don't want to listen to me write or talk, then don't listen to me write or talk. If you don't want to follow me on social platforms, guess what? The unfollow button is either blue or green on most social platforms. But I do believe that there's an, there's a, there's a, um, a right or a duty for non-black people in particular in this case, right? Or non-trans people or non-LGBTQ, a plus people, identifying people to uh, listen and amplify the voices um, that are being heard. And I just interviewed someone on my podcast, uh, Javi, who's gonna be featured on next week. I mean, he said it perfectly, right? He, the man, Javi said that this movement, this all Black Lives Matter movement will not be successful if the movement is not intersectional. 
right mm. so if we don't if we do not censor the voices of the the the, the marginalized voices in not just the all of black lives matter movement but also other movements that may um center racial injustice um then we're not gonna make progress we're not gonna we're not gonna be successful and i think that is a requirement on us and i'm speaking on myself to continue to educate myself and continue to do the internal work so that i can best be not just an um an hopeful ally but also an advocate uh when i'm asked and or have the opportunity to speak whether that's at work or on any of the other platforms that i you know currently hold ownership to yeah yeah and and what you saying, continue to educate yourself. I, I know that means different things for different people, but do you mind sharing like a way or a, a few ways that, that you've begun to educate yourself? Yeah, I think, again, the podcast, uh, number one, um, because I'm bringing people on that definitely have different experiences than I do. Uh, and my job, some of them, I'm sure yours right now as well as to listen, right? You're, you're listening to different things that I'm saying, listening to what I'm saying, how I'm saying it, why I'm saying it, you know, putting it in the context. I think another... Um, Another way that I've continued to educate myself is to read, read and even be uncomfortable with, uncomfortable with some of the things that I do not agree with. And that's becoming increasingly harder. Um, and I say that because it helps when uh, developing my own arguments, developing my own philosophies on how I can lead people. Uh, because the fact of the matter is, right, like there's, there, are, there are colleagues that we work with, um, what, in particular at the University of Maryland, who may, who may continue to, to support and echo All Lives Matter, right? There are colleagues that I work with uh, who will continue to uh, say Blue Lives Matter and not understand and or support this All Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but even uh, digging deeper, there are students that, I ha that I'm required and mandated to support and serve that also hold true to these bl uh, Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter uh, philosophies and practices. And, not just to keep my job, but also to be a servant leader um, and an educator. Like I need, I need to be familiar with like like where they're coming from, so that I can meet them where they're at, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's that's one thing that has become increasingly harder. If I'm being transparent about uh, how I show up at work, uh, what conversations I what, what conversations and meetings I engage myself in, or you know, throw myself to be a part in. What to go back to the self care piece? Like I, I don't. I, I think I'm to the point now where, I'm, where to your to, to your point earlier, I'm focused on action. Um, and so mm. if we're continuing to have conversations about like, what do you feel as a black person in our, on our staff? Or like, what do you feel as a black student athlete? We need to do like, I'm done talking. Uh, I'm done. I'm done talking. Like, what, what are we doing? And how can mm. I best be an added value uh, to that movement and to that practice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm. I mean, I'm with you on that, like a hundred percent. Because I feel that over over the past, you know, so, so many years. Um, yes, I mean, I, I am for protests, but I also understand that protests aren't for everybody necessarily. Mm -hmm. yep. and, 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 you know, some people's protests might look like a podcast. Other people's protests might look like speaking. Other people's protests might be like in your position where you're developing leaders and you're helping them think and helping them cultivate their philosophies. So I'm, 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 I'm definitely with you on that. And I'm, I'm grateful that I, I feel this go around. We've been began to see, like I said before, some changes taking place. Of course, there's still, you know, still a lot of a lot of work to do. But you know, the race isn't given to the swift. No, it's not. It's not. That's a great point, though. Really good point. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I so I want to just uh, tr transition here because I, I I know we 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 could be there all day. But but I but I want to I want to make a s slight segue, and 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 then and then Tim, I feel that you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel you recently picked picked up a new interest of sport or, or a new uh, sport of interest, and uh, from 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 what I've seen, I I, I think you now have a, have a slight interest in, in NASCAR. I do, I do have an interest <laughs> in NASCAR, and I, I hope to still be. Um, at the Indy 500, uh, May 2021, um, and I think even that sport, like we we're not, we could, we could be on here for two hours talking about this. But what what Bubba, Bubba Wallace did and continues to do, um, personally speaking, like felt a lot like what I was trying to do as an undergrad at the University of South Carolina before I got impeached from my position as president of Paternity Council, um, and that's be the only black right who is truly trying to create systemic change within a system that has been historically white and historically racist, right? And so um, the, him speaking up, uh, the, the Confederate flags coming down, um, there's was a lot of flashbacks in a lot of ways. And so um, whatever I can do to support Bubba, I, I'll make it happen. Like, well, I'll be in Indy next uh, in 11 months. 
<laughs> okay, okay, Tim, you 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 can't drop that right there, Tim, and then just leave it. Talk, you got you got to talk a little. Bit. Why why did you get impeached? Yes, yeah, so the short story, uh, long story short, I got elected as the first black president to be elected of attorney council. So in South Carolina, there are or there were um, uh, members of IFC, which is historically white, MPHC, which is uh, historically black and then a multicultural Greek council. So it ended up being like 23 organizations and about 1700 men. Anywho, um, six months into my, no, four months into my leadership, we had a student pass away, a student die due to alcohol related hazing uh, in a white fraternity. Um, six months after that, which led us, or five months after that, excuse me, which led us to the first day of school in like August, 2015. There were, uh, it was four, four, hospitaliz four hospitalizations in the first three days of school due to alcohol related hazing. Oh God. The first time it happened in March, March 18, 2015, I didn't do anything, uh, which goes back to leadership and understanding lessons and learn, lessons learned and failures. Um, I didn't do anything, didn't speak up. Um, and I regretted it. When it happened again, I was like, it's not, like, y'all gotta go. So we halted recruitment. Um, it was like several of us halted recruitment uh, of the white fraternities. The other white fraternities did not appreciate that. And they put myself in the vice president of recruitment for impeachment. Uh, the vice president of recruitment resigned. I said, y'all gotta impeach me. So they impeached me. Um, and that's when I tweeted out that tweet that's, that's pinned on my Twitter right now entitled, You Can't Impeach Vision, uh, which is where a lot of my whether leadership philosophy, my practice, and my, me being built on the website. Um, that's where I mean, a lot of it stemmed from that, that experience, serving as president of fraternity council. Wow. Which is similar to like what, what Bubba's going through with NASCAR right now. I'm like, yo, like, I get it, bro. Trust me. Like, I, wow. I'm with you. Man. Oh, man. The world we live in, the world Definitely. we, the, the world we live in. But Tim, I, 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 I want to let you get out of here, but I can't let you get out of here before I run you through the two minute drill. Well, and, definitely. And, and like, like I told you a little bit about it, the two minute drills, we just have a few rapid fire questions, just give you a chance just to have a little bit of fun, allow people to, to get to know you a, a little bit also, on just, uh, just from a different angle, lightning round style. So are you ready? And let's get here, it. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. Here we go. Favorite food? Uh, pizza. What kind of pizza? Um, if, if it's ideal, half pepperoni, half bacon, and pineapple. Oh, okay, okay. Last book you read? Ooh. It'll probably be How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Oh, that's, that, yeah, that's, that's a solid classic. Yeah, you gotta have that one in the collection. What, what's, uh, so, so what's your, what's your go-to podcast? My go-to, I mean, for my own, first and foremost. So Walk With TFB is my okay. go-to. If it's not my own, uh, one that I'm uh, loving right now is the Two Abbey Holes podcast, hosted by Rachel and Chelsea. Uh, and they will probably be tied with uh, the Boom Pod. Boom Pod, Future Pod, Future Pod, Future Pod. Most definitely. Your, your, your Netflix quarantine show of preference. So I just finished uh, Money Heist, which is definitely number one Netflix show of all time. Oh, wow. But number two would be Queen of the South. That's easy. Uh, okay. It might be tied for number one, actually. But. Uh, okay. And then uh, la last question is to bring us home. What, what's, what, what's one tip that you want to leave with the student athlete? Ooh, yeah, so I would say, um, wow. I'll leave you with a quote from our president, my president, uh, Barack Obama, who said, um, change will not come if we, if we wait for some of the person or some of the time. We're the ones we've been waiting for. We're the change that we see. Uh, so understanding that, that change will not come until we make it happen, right? Like you were the one that you've been waiting for, which I think going back to your question initially about like how have you done so many things. Like I realized that um, I'm the one, like me asking like, who's going to do this, like that was an, a question back to me. Um, and so to my student athletes who are listening on the call or even to you know, anyone else who's listening, uh, don't wait for someone to see the change you, that you wish to see in the world. Um, but to do that, continue to identify your passion, continue to inspire vision, but most importantly, continue to walk in purpose. Dope, dope, dope. And then where, where can where can the where can the ballers find you at? Uh, go ahead, just share your your your, your social media and even your website because I know you do. I know you do speaking also. Definitely up. So uh, you can find me on all social platforms and LinkedIn at Timothy uh, T is in Tim. Timothy, uh, F is in Ford, <laughs> Bryson, uh, B-R-Y-S-O-N on all social platforms. Uh, my website is timothyfbryson.com. Um, and then my podcast, again, is Walk With TFB, uh, available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well.
Definitely, definitely. Well, future Dr. Tim, we, we, we definitely appreciate you, you know, taking time to, to hang out with the ballers and coming on the Beyond the Ball podcast. Uh, man, and to all, all the ballers out there, we would encourage you, make sure uh, to, to get future Dr. Tim's information. It's going to be all down in the show notes, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and I'm going to have it all down there. Uh, and then everybody, check his podcast out, leave a rate and review. And then also, Make sure that you're following us as well on Instagram at Go Beyond the Ball. Until next time, all right, Dr. Tim. Peace, my brother. Peace out, thank you.